Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome Amaryllis Fox. It's such Thank a pleasure so to get much. to talk with you in person this time. It is a great pleasure. I was saying just, just before that as, as an old San Francisco hand, your voice is so familiar to me <laughs> from hours on the radio. And wow. uh, thank you for all you, you do to inform all of us. It's a oh. real pleasure to get wow, to put a face with a voice. That's so nice of you to say. Well, let me tell you, your book was a total page turner. Mm -hmm. And when I finished it, my first thought was, I will never complain about my job again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, first, what does it mean to be in clandestine service at the CIA and to be under non-official cover? How is that different from other roles at the CIA? So the, the role of CIA um, it, it, that, that sets it apart from the military, from really other, other parts of the intelligence community, is to build human relationships, relationships with human sources who are, for whatever reason, positioned to be able to help us predict or prevent acts of war or acts of terrorism. And increasingly, that's a, a really rare and powerful thing in an age of, of reliance on technical surveillance and mm. technical warfare. I, I always say it's, uh, it's sort of like how if you have friends who you follow on social media and then friends that you see once a week for a drink, right? The friends that you follow on social media, you know the facts of their life, right? If they've had a baby or, or they, they post a photo where they're getting engaged, you know those data points. But if you see them for a drink every week, you know how they feel about all those things. You know whether they're afraid to get married or you know they're, they're planning to have babies before they announce them. And that ability to understand somebody's fears, their dreams, their hopes, their plans and aspirations allows you to, to predict geopolitics in a way that, that technical data points just can't. It's the why instead of the what. And so human intelligence gatherers, CIA officers, um, are tasked with going out and doing this, at its best, very soulful work of meeting and identifying sources that have the potential to to want to leave this legacy of protecting lives. Um, and slowly, slowly building enough trust um, and, and rapport with these, these sources to be able to move them to a place where you can do that work together. But there are analysts and there are CIA officers who have official cover. Like, right. for example, they're a diplomat. Uh, they're somebody who is known and important enough that in a pinch you can get them out of a hairy situation. But if you're in non-official cover, aren't you basically, I mean, you don't have... Um, you don't have those those benefits. Yeah, right? you know, one one touchstone that I often offer for people is Argo. If you guys have seen the movie Argo, right? So this is the 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 true story of of a CIA operation to go into Iran and rescue some Americans, and in order to do so, they created a fictional film production company, right? And went um, in order to in order to you know, pretend to location scout, but actually they were doing this operational work. And the advantage of non-official cover like that is that you can put yourself in places where you are not likely to be as a diplomat or, or a, a U.S. government official. Um, it explains why you are in the far-flung regions you need to be in to stop many of these attacks or do these kinds of operations. The challenge is that you don't have diplomatic immunity, right. you know, and um, you don't have the emotional comfort of a, of a shared work environment where uh, all of the the operational considerations can fall away and you can sit with fellow officers every day and, you know, get advice, share stories, be in one another's company. Yes. Um, so it, it makes it quite lonely work where there's no one who really fully shares your truth. And the training for the work that you did, I think also gives a sense of just how dangerous it is. I mean, you're learning how to, to 
use a Glock. You're learning how to withstand torture. I mean, you're you're learning things that, as I said, make anyone rethink their current job and what they're going to complain about it. But um, I do remember going and being in my friend's wedding, and my wrists were completely raw from learning some some uh, E and E like escape and evasion <laughs> techniques, and uh, being in the in the formal gown and her saying, "I'm not even going to ask what that is." But uh, she had no idea what I was doing at the time. She's like, what did you spend your, your week doing? So, um, you know, there, there, there are some, some curious marks that it leaves. Is there a habit, like a surveillance habit or some kind of habit that you picked up from such intense training that you find even today is hard to shake? I, I, you know, one of the things or that is, is kind of surprising, I think, given the depictions in the movies, is that a lot of what we're taught is to be really boring a lot of the time, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> not whole, to stand out. Yeah, yeah, not to stand out, to be non-alerting. It, 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 all of the kind of uh, roof gymnastics and Glock juggling that you see in the movies, <laughs> you know, like that one chase scene through city streets and, you know, your cover's blown and you're either out of the country or you're in jail. And that is not a very efficient or practical way to go about this work. So really, a lot of what you're doing is for the 90 percent of the time where you're not operational is is being as dull as possible. Um, and so I think the operational habits that stick with me uh, are are those. They, it drives my husband crazy that I stop at every orange light, right, every <laughs> yellow light. Um because you're very rule abiding. Well, you're not. But when you know, when you're in a situation where you might have somebody uh, in a car behind you and you do the kind of normal thing that anyone would do, which is to skate through that yellow light, you you risk that person thinking that you're trying to lose them. And that is alerting and, and raises a whole can also just annoy people. So so a, a lot of the behavior is not what you would think from from the screen, but it's all there designed to keep you safe so that in the moment where you are ready to, to invite this source to, to help do this work, that both of you have been protected throughout the process of development. As you talk about trying to be boring, your identity, your fake identity was as an art dealer and you were living in Shanghai and you literally had the Chinese government surveilling you, but you had a housekeeper who worked for the government who lived with you, right, during that time. And so you had to be as normal as possible while you're going out and trying to infiltrate, you know, illicit arms deals and, and networks in the Middle East as well. I mean, you were traveling to, to the Middle East as you're doing this. And I remember this moment that you talk about where a CIA officer presents you with a photo of you crying um, and it had been taken by the Chinese surveillors, but because the CIA was surveilling the Chinese, they had that image and they said, what was going on here with you? And it was this very private moment for you. You were crying alone. And the fact that it was just like these levels of surveillance and just the intensity of how intimately they watched every move in your life, how did you how did you act normally? How were you able to create a life for years knowing that you had that level of surveillance? It, it is very immersive and at times very lonely because uh, in a way when, when uh, there's that degree of presence everywhere, it's almost nowhere. I mean, you're, you're really alone in, in your truth for the most part. Um, I... I understand from friends of mine who are actors that it's sort of similar to method acting, right, where you really have to kind of uh, immerse yourself in in the role or the version of yourself that you are at that time. I think that I had, because I started so young, this idea that, um, you know, at the end of all of this, when I left, when I drove out the gates for the last time, that all of those different versions of myself that I'd had to keep straight would kind of fall away and I would like magically be this integrated, authentic version of myself that was completely present with every person. And what I actually found is that in many ways, it, it, having different versions of ourselves isn't just for intelligence officers. This thing that had felt really unique to me and maybe had heightened stakes for me in, in the field 
was actually the same thing that I saw my friends and my sisters and other people doing where, you know, there's there's the one version of themselves on their Instagram account and another version for their parents and another version for their boss. And this temptation to kind of lock the armor down and seem stronger or cooler than we are, right? Which we all feel that. And certainly in geopolitics, there's that tendency. Um, and so I think in a way it prepared me for, for the same challenges as we all face in everyday life. Wow. <coughs> for, the, for that degree of social media mm. or image, um, shaping, I guess that we, we do now as a result of social media, you also mentioned, and it was a really interesting way, I think, to characterize the role of a CIA officer, which was this very human role, this, mm. this role of getting to know someone so intimately. Can you talk about how you did that and just tell the story of the man that you befriended and then ultimately turned uh, to become an asset for you who was an illicit arms, arms dealer? How you, how you, like the specific human vulnerabilities that you were able to key in on with this person that created the connection needed for him ultimately to, to trust you. Yeah. Um, so the character who is referred to as Jakob in the book is a really interesting example. And several of the operational characters have a few composite um, elements from in order to, to preserve their identity. But Jakob was a really important one for me to include because it, it, he really does illustrate the the power of understanding the human motivations that drive violence or drive criminal activity in this case. He, uh, he was a very imposing, brutish figure of a, of a man. <coughs> and yet he had this very lyrical singing voice. And I actually heard a singing voice before I saw his face. And so I was, uh, as I approached him on, on the street, he, he, he was singing and he, he turned around and had this kind of brutalist, Stalinist kind of face uh, and tattoos. Um, but his voice sounded really sorrowful and kind of had this folk song quality to it that felt almost nostalgic, even though it wasn't from my own childhood. And I had the sense right away that there was some other depth or layer to him um, that that his face really belied. And over the course of <coughs> over the course of developing him and getting to know him, um, I asked him about a, a ring that he wore and that had a lamb on it. And he said that it he wore it because it reminded him of his grandfather um, and to be to be strong. And I said, oh, you know, your, your grandfather was strong. And he said, no, you know, I wanted him to be a lion, but he, but he was a lamb. And he uh, was was taken, tortured and eventually killed um, by the authoritarian government in the Eastern European country that he came from back in, in the communist era. And he said it with this kind of dismissive, almost disgust as though he had been raised to be stronger than that. But underneath it, I sort of sensed that there was, there was a respect for the heroism of this man who had died for his values um, in, in such a violent way. And over the course of the time that uh, we built that relationship, I saw more and more of that glimmer in him, of this idea that he wanted to leave um, a world for his kids that was less likely to give rise to authoritarianism, the less likely to give rise to the kind of, of policing activity that had taken his grandfather. And to be able to connect for him the work that he was doing in the arms dealing world with the potential ramifications for his kids in his country far away took a little bit of time. But the more that he understood that an attack anywhere um, in today's globalized society gives governments everywhere um, the ability and the tendency to crack down harder, um, both in authoritarian regimes and in Western liberal pluralistic democracies, as we've seen since 9-11 here and in Europe. Um, and if he truly wanted to move his, his country beyond this legacy that had taken his grandfather, 
selling weapons that could be used in, in an attack anywhere um, were, was going to endanger that, that goal. And he could, in fact, be a part of his grandfather's legacy in instead working to prevent the attacks that would allow that kind of an authoritarian crackdown. Um, and it took a long time to be able to, to, to kind of nurture the flicker of that understanding inside of him and give him the courage to, to make that leap. But that is the, the work that human intelligence officers do. And it's very, um, it's very quiet and it takes a long time. And officers do it you know, in meetings in countries all around the world every day. And one of the really challenging things about the work is never actually knowing when it's successful. You know, it's very easy to know when it fails, right? Because the attack happens. But, um, but when we think about it being successful, and there, you know, there's another scene in the book where uh, it's another meeting, really equally quiet, soulful, connected meeting. But in that case, um, the objective is to uh, to do anything possible to either delay or, or prevent um, a, what we had heard was a planned attack. And in those cases, which happen all around the world every day, you actually don't know whether, first of all, the information you got that the attack was planned is reliable, real, authentic. Secondly, you don't know whether whatever weapon was supposed to have changed hands actually did, whether that weapon was real or was a scam, because these scams happen all over the world, whether it was in working order, if it was real, whether even if it was in working order, these organizations had somebody with enough familiarity with that technology to actually deploy it. And then if all of that uh, was established, whether in fact the attack didn't happen not because of the work that we did, but because perhaps a different target was picked or a different date was chosen for some you know, strategic or logistical reason. So it's very conditional and difficult to know on, on any given day whether a particular operation was in fact successful, but it's the, the human connection that, that drives it when it is. Uh, given the fact that I think it's so important if you're in something as stressful and consuming as the work that you do as a CIA officer, how do you motivate yourself then when success is so rare or mm. unclear, even if it happens? It's, it's a difficult thing to, to never know on a given day whether what you've done net-net was positive for, for short and long-term lives saved or not. You know, and I, I think that's the challenge any individual human has of not being able to, to see the collective from the bird's eye view. Um, if short term, uh, a, 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 an adversary is taken off the playing field, are the lives that were saved by that operation worth whatever potential future adversaries were created by that attack, you know, whether through grief or alienation or revenge. Um, and that was a, that was a trade-off that was front of mind for, for all of us um, on a regular basis. I think more than what motivated me to do it, it was the question of knowing that, especially once I had my daughter, there were other mothers on all sides of this conflict whose kids you know, we're walking to school down these very streets. The question was sort of more how not to do it. Mm. And I think that was the case for for all of the kind of brothers and sisters that I came up with, and many of them are still at it. Um, it it's, uh, it's a long-term calling, because I don't think there's any given day where you can say, you know, job done. Well, wow, kids really have an incredible way of changing your orientation to the world, don't they? <laughs> for sure. And I'm kind of hearing a little bit of what I think is the through line to those realizations as an officer and the peace work that you're doing now. Um, you've talked a little bit about the small, subtle things that can predict unrest um, in a town or city. And so, and we'll talk a little bit about what those small, subtle things are, but I think also just this question of 
it, it, it shows you how you could potentially address the unrest, but it also makes me realize in reading some of the examples that you've shared, um, how it feels like the potential for unrest is everywhere, everywhere. all the time. Um, so talk a little bit about the subtle things that you like to point to as examples that people should look at in terms of creating an environment that would be ripe for some kind of conflict or unrest. And this is beyond, not necessarily war per se, but just yeah. the, the kind of initial unrest that creates larger. Well, I think there are two things really. I think there are environmental factors um, and then human uh, human behavior, or human uh, response factors. And, and in the former category, this was a lot of the work that I was doing as a graduate student when I first came to the agency was looking at historical data and and identifying correlations that might not seem evident right away, but that historically had been tied to terror attacks or, or terror planning in regions that didn't want the groups there but weren't able to get rid of them. And uh, they were very informative and interesting data points, things like the percentage beneath livable wage that a border guard gets paid, and therefore the potential for graft for, for giving a bribe to a border officer and crossing illegally. So they would be susceptible to exactly. that. Exactly. You know, if you, if you are being paid a quarter of what it takes to survive, um, I often equate it with uh, being a, a waiter or a waitress here where you're expected to work for tips. And and many border officers and other government officials in many parts of the world are expected to work for tips. You know, their salary hmm. is, is so actually set <laughs> to allow for the fact that it will be padded in this way. Um, and when you, when you see the correlation between that and these security challenges, you realize, hey, here's something that by paying people more and some, you know, other, other work that needs to be done around corruption in these countries, isn't this a, a cheaper, more efficient way than waiting until the problem is such that you have to go in and, and pay in both lives and treasure with, with an actual military response, right? But actually increasing wages, for example, as we've learned here, there's a lot of socioeconomic shifts that sometimes need to take place to even be able to do something as simple as raise the wage of a board. Absolutely. Board. And those shifts can often be another contributing factor, which is what makes the whole thing com so complex. Like yes. another of the factors um, that historically is tied to data is, is anything that indicates too quick a social change. So one of them that was interesting in the Middle East was the percentage of, or the ratio of hookah bars to madrasas and how fast that ratio is changing. Um, and so, you know, people take time often to adjust to social evolutions and when social change happens too quickly, for some people it can feel jarring and the response can be seeking out some group that feels familiar, that still values you, that still prioritizes you, that still prioritizes your beliefs. We certainly are seeing that yeah. here at home in different, um, in, in different extremist um, realms in our own society. But talk about specifically what hookah, the proportion of hookah bars to madrasas, that shifting, what does that indicate? Well, you know, the, in, in areas, whether it's one way or the other, in areas where madrasas have been prevalent, that that's a, a very religious conservative community seeing seeing more of the kind of uh, entertainment oriented you know pleasures of the flesh kind of places turning up in your neighborhood can be very jarring, and vice versa. When we see areas that have been very pluralistic and open to to uh, different ways of gathering socially, yes. move much more into a, a conservative religious posture too quickly, that also can be jarring. So you're talking about these significant, it, it indicates cultural shifts, cultural differences, potential strife. It feels like you're almost describing the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, I, it's something that I think we need to be so aware of, um, and it's one of the reasons that I, I think it's important to talk about these lessons learned post 9-11 overseas, because increasingly they do feel relevant to me domestically. I mean, the, the other, when I said they're the physical and then the, um, the emotional contributing factors, I see many of those as a result um, here in, in the US and Western Europe today as well. These are things like um, feelings of alienation 
of um, humiliation, shame, uh, those are really, really powerful motivating factors for violence. violence. And we forget, you know, sometimes I think we like to to kind of think of it as playing risk where it's, it's um, you know, removed from the messy world of human emotions and just becomes a game of, you know, strategic cleverness. But the reality is that every one of these acts is, is actually planned and executed by human beings. And those human beings are coming from their own set of experiences and have their own set of emotional needs. And when those needs include feeling heard, feeling valued in, in a time where they are struggling with shame, humiliation, alienation, um, many people will believe things or participate in things that they wouldn't otherwise. And I think you know, not to get too deep into the psychology, but it's something that we used to think about a lot, that many psychologists will tell you that most fears boil down in one way or another to the kind of core human fear of mortality, right? Will I, you know, I'm not going to be here forever. So given that I'm here now, A, will people remember me? B, do I matter? Does the fact that I'm here matter? Um, and the, the kind of scream, I matter, hear me, see me. It's what we see with graffiti on city streets, right? It's a very primal human impulse. And when it goes frustrated for, for too long, it can express itself in spasms of violence. And I think Joker, I just saw Joker, the, the film this week, and I think it, um, it does an extraordinary job, actually, of, of uh, narrating the feelings that I often heard in the debriefing room um, that caused abhorrent acts of violence. Uh, but in their, in their earliest seeds before they grew into something so toxic were really um, feelings of, of needing to be seen and, and heard um, in an environment where they weren't. It, it, the A.Q. Khan example that we talked about earlier I think is a really powerful one where A.Q. Khan's network is responsible for uh, nuclear weapons proliferation in a way that we've never seen before, the, not just state programs, but even even rogue, rogue states and, and non-state actors. And his backstory, when you hear him tell it, despite the fact that what he has done has, has put the world at risk in a way that probably no single other human has, actually, when you look at the potential ramifications, he talks about being a teenager and having saved up for a fountain pen and being on a train crossing uh, the, the new border to Pakistan and the Indian guard when he took his customs card saying, oh, that's a nice pen, I'll take that too. And he went, no, I saved up for that. You know, you can't do that. And he said, oh, can't I? You know, watch me. And took the pen and walked away. And in his teenage mind, he was so angry that he was powerless to stop this thing that felt so unfair that he said, you know, I, I will never be powerless again. Pakistan will never be powerless again. And this, you know, metastasized into this terrible desire to create the Pakistani nuclear program and in so doing to, to obtain the uranium for it from the uranium uh, deposits in Libya. And so to trade nuclear components with Libya to do that on and on and on, this, this monster kind of grew out of control. And I think that origin story, you know, while, while there was a lot of blue water between the pen and the nuclear program, it, it's such an important one for us to remember that these tiny moments of choosing to treat somebody with respect or, or not can have huge ramifications down the road. But so what is the solution? I mean, are we supposed to suddenly start respecting the violent faction of the alt-right? You know, I, like... What do we? What do you do to try to avoid something like somebody, some of that, something like that festering and turning ultimately to violence, especially if someone manages to access weapons? It's it's really difficult, right? It's ongoing work. The the I think the ideal time, of course, to have 
have those moments of respectful dialogue is before radicalization, <laughs> but we can't always rewind and go back to that. Um, it, it, there is amazing work being done on this. There's a group called Life After Hate that uh, is is actually organized by former extremists who who go and take those who've been radicalized and, and sort of bring them back from the brink. Sasha Havlicek does the same thing out of the UK with um, those who are exploring Islamic extremism. But I think more broadly in our just everyday interactions, the, the responsibility on each of us is to try to be alert to t some tiny sliver of common ground, right? The ability to take off the adversarial hat for a minute and find some small thing that you connect on that's separate from what you disagree about. And what you disagree about is still going to be there, believe me. But, you know, you could talk about sports for a second. You can talk about national parks for a second. There's going to be something, I promise you, as wild as it might seem to think that you and somebody with these abhorrent views, whichever flavor they might be, share something in common. I promise you, you do. And sometimes the hard work is, is trying to find what that is so that you can have an exchange that establishes enough respect and dialogue that when you return to these very serious issues that you disagree on, the, the, the knot is a little bit looser and you're able to kind of begin to untangle it a little bit. And it's hard and long work. You, you don't fix these things in one conversation. But I, I do think we should all feel really empowered to, to make these changes in the future by the, by the dignity with which we treat one another today. Given what you have learned about human nature and what to watch for. We're about to enter an election year. The dialogue is likely to get much coarser as a result of it. I mean, are you hopeful for our country? I read at one point that the one thing that keeps you up at night now mm -hmm. is the polarization in this nation, the, the division and what feels like a powder keg ready to explode with just a little more discord or just the perfectly um, placed uh, state-sponsored campaign. <laughs> I, I, it is the 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 threat that keeps me up at night. You know, I think that the terror groups are still out there. The rogue states are still out there. We still have geopolitical adversaries, but we also have, you know, one of, if not the strongest military industrial, com the military intelligence complex, but also military industrial complex um, in the world to, to predict and to prevent and if necessary to respond to those kinds of threats. But what our adversaries have done recently, and yes, I mean Russia, I also mean groups like ISIS and others, is realizing correctly that they are outgunned and outspent on the battlefield and that they're not gonna win in a traditional conflict against the United States, but that shrewdly they have figured out there is a much more efficient and effective way, which is to sow this discord and allow us to, to tear to our house work. down yeah. from within. And it's something I think we need to be very alert to because it, it's not just about one particular issue or one particular candidate. If we look at the ads that were funded um, in the Russian example, these are the most extreme sides on both sides of every wedge issue. You know, we have pro pro life and pro choice ads, Black Lives Matter, and you know, police protection ads, on and on and on down the line. And the clear the clear objective is to to move voters away from the center to either side and and so discord in that way and every time that we have a you know middle school food fight on cable news which you know is is <laughs> fairly frequent <laughs> these days um i think we're playing right into that strategy and it it really seems to me that um the military and intelligence complex can't save us from this one. You know, this one is on each and every one of us. And I think finding common ground with one another is really the greatest act of patriotism any of us can engage in right now. Well, we've been collecting questions. Yes. <laughs> we've been collecting questions from the audience, and I wanted to incorporate some of them now. This very first one is from Dr. Patrick Riley. 
First, thank you for your bravery. Are you concerned about the potential reciprocity of the current administration and outing yourself in this public way? Sincerely, a fellow colleague in the IC. Um, I mean, I think I, I think Dr. Riley might be alluding to, to some extent, too, that it's been reported that you did not have official permission mm -hmm. from the CIA to publish your book and to publish all of these secrets. Can you clarify that? Sure. And do you worry about any, you know actions by this administration against you? Sure. Um, you know, this book didn't actually, uh, you know, out me to use his words. Um, my my uh, service has been out, out since 2016, and, you know, the agency multiple times has has confirmed it to reporters in writing. And so the, this, this process has been a very long one, but um, began there. Before, um, before putting pen to paper to write this book, I had um, guidance around what had to be changed and omitted. And it was a fair amount. You know, they're, they're, the operational scenes here, um, as it says on the first page of the book, the names and locations have been changed, but also operational details and, and identifying details have been, in some cases, um, you know, compositized in order to retain the truth of the lessons of these interactions knocked into me, um, but to, to ensure that, uh, that there's nothing in there um, that shouldn't be in there. Uh, the, other, the other thing I think that made this easier for me uh, as a process, and it is, I think, a challenging process for many people, is the fact that it's it's really a personal story. I mean, this is a story about the evolution of my perspective about how we should be going about resolving this war. It's also the story of of becoming a wife and a mom and juggling those responsibilities with the role that we all feel, uh, or the pre you know the pressure we all feel to to make the world that our kids are going to inherit a safer place. And a lot of the book. Um, you know, for anyone who who hasn't had a chance to read it, is is really about that journey um, uh, that that we all share. I think as as parents and spouses um, uh, of that tension. Uh, and you know, the other thing to remember, though, it makes me feel old, is that this is all <laughs> this uh, uh, this is 15, 20 years ago. You know, so I I was kind of in some ways the last the last of the, I guess, Cold War generation. I mean, I joined after 9-11, but my mm. teachers were all sort of old Cold Warriors. And our work was really before biometrics and facial recognition and all of these challenges um, were out on, on the playing field every day. And so, you know, it's almost nostalgic when you look at the tradecraft that I was learning. Like, yeah. this is stuff that, like, you could, you know, you still had, like, a, a wig and glasses. Right? Right. Like, this is stuff that just yeah. doesn't fly anymore. Um, I love the example of if you wanted, if somebody wanted to meet with you, you gave them a Starbucks card, and then you would check to see if they yeah. bought a latte. <laughs> and then, like, within 24 hours... That was that, high tech. Yeah, you know? that's, like, the most high tech <laughs> thing I learned. Um, but it's a very different... It's a very different challenge now, and and yes. one that the tradecraft has, I'm sure, evolved enormously since since I've left um, to counter. But no, I mean, for me, it was much more um, a, a sharing of these interactions and also a, a, a call to service, really, especially for young women, because I just feel like the the Hollywood depictions of young women in national security work um, are so. Uh, uh, demeaning and incomplete. Um, they you mean I, the sense that they kind of make them like incredible warrior athletic. Well, like, I think we, so. we either don't see them, right? <laughs> or I mean, they're they're either you know male, male characters or the female characters, you know, seem to be kind of this femme fatale archetype yes. with like thigh high boots kicking doors down, right? And, you know, I get that it's sort of exciting popcorn fare, but the reality for, uh, for young women who are finishing up school and thinking about how they want to serve their community and their country is, you know, if they are a substantive, intelligent, soulful person who wants to do meaningful work, they're not seeing those films and thinking, yes, this is for me, right? And I really do believe that each of us, if, if we get quiet, 
um, and, and listen to ourselves have a unique call to service to our community, to our country. Um, and it's different for everyone. But I wanted, I wanted young people of color, young women, people who don't see themselves in these roles on the screen to know that not only should they consider them, but they're actually needed more than anyone else. And your story has been picked up uh, by Apple. Mm. Is that right? And Brie Larson will yeah. be playing you as well. So there, is, you, there I, will be, uh, you will be on screen. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, will uh, be on screen. Uh, Brie is really a force of nature. She's one of those, you know, rare actors who not only could have done every role she's played in real life, but could have done them all at once. I mean, it, her brain is electric. She's got an incredibly strong moral core. And she's very, very aware of what's happening in the world and what the challenges are. Um, she and I are really interested in what conflict looks like when it's it's waged and resolved by women um, in contrast to men. And uh, so I think you can expect this project to be very entertaining, but a lot more authentic and, and in-depth than some of the, the previous representations of this kind of work on and screen. when is it supposed to come out? Uh, next year is the filming, and so likely, I while. guess, the year after, but yeah. I, I, don't, um, I don't have the... the uh, I don't think there's a firm date yet because the writer's room is up and running now, but it's an extraordinary team with a lot of women and a lot of voices from the countries where, where we'll be working. Well, let me ask you this question from Myra. Given the attitude of the president today, is it more difficult for the CIA to do its job? The president seems not to trust our intelligence. That's a much nicer way than I would have <laughs> potentially phrased that. But yes, yeah. there has been a lot of talk about how President Trump has essentially debased the intelligence agency's findings with regard to Russian interference in the election. And I remember very early on, because um, I interviewed Leon Panetta for a show, I think it was related to North Korea, but in doing research for that, I remembered how how he felt about the president standing in front of that wall of stars for fallen CIA officers mm -hmm. and talking about the crowd size of his inauguration. And so, yeah, what's been the impact on the CIA? Is it harder, as Myra asked, to do its work? Well, I left a decade ago, so, uh, you know, any... Any perspective I can offer, I think, is is well, what was your fr reaction from the to outs it? outside. What was your reaction but, to it? Well, I will tell you this. I think that the intelligence community realizes that they are a part of a, a tradition of government that um, will outlast any particular holder of any particular office. And I think that as messy and as difficult as it is for us as a country to go through it. Um, the 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 system is working. You know, information of concern has been put in front of uh, representatives of the people, and they are assessing it on its merits. Uh, we can hope, and uh, the 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 process will run its course. I think that the the intelligence community is full of um, grown-ups, and I think that they understand, um, I think that they understand that, uh, they, they have, in some sense, a higher and longer-term calling, uh, and that they need to continue to do the important work that they're tasked with, um, and the, uh, allow the, the, checks and balances as messy as they are to watch in action um, to, to continue to, to grind towards a resolution here. Well, this uh, audience member asks, can you maybe talk about any thoughts you have on Burma or Myanmar? It's an interesting question, and I, I wanted to ask this to you because you spent the beginning part of the book talking about this very unique opportunity that you had to... Um, to interview Aung San Suu Kyi. And of course, things have changed dramatically in terms mm -hmm. of how she is perceived as a result of uh, the Rohingya Muslims. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you want to Sure, yeah, I, the Share portrait that I on, have of her is currently upside down on our photograph table to, to oh, signal really? distress. Um, but uh, yeah, she was, um, 
she was and, and is an important um, milestone for, for me in recognizing in my own life that, you know, A, the power of truth telling can bring an authoritarian military to its knees, which as an 18 year old was an electrifying idea for me. Um, that's how old you were when you interviewed her. That's right. So I, I went in as an aspiring baby journalist and interviewed Aung San Suu Kyi while she was under house arrest um, in 1999, uh, for which I was detained by the Burmese military and then deported. Um, and that, that, uh, experience really uh, demonstrated for me that this one, you know, physically tiny woman uh, whose hand fit in mine like a child's when I met her uh, could, could say words on tape for an hour or two and that could be subversive enough to, to bring, you know, military trucks down the street to put us in the back and sew up the canvas and take us to, to a detention on our way out of the country. Um, and that, that idea that truth is, is more powerful than the gun, I think was seated with me then. Um, but it also made the, the idea of her letting down those that, you know, had believed for so many decades uh, a lot harder for me when it happened. I, I had not been back in Burma since I was detained in 1999, and I went back for these recent elections, which were, I guess, in 2015 or 16, um, and stood on the same street outside NLD headquarters where we had been picked up for doing that interview by a military truck. And I have video of it on my phone, but it was shoulder to shoulder in every direction as far as you could see with people singing democracy songs, waving the, the fighting peacock flag, um, which would have been sufficient to get you arrested, you know, back in 99. And from, you know, that's, that's an incredibly quick evolution in a country, speaking of, of you know, social change causing unrest and, and a retreat to, to partisan politics. That's really exactly what we've seen in Burma, where um, Facebook was hugely important in bringing about the democratic changes there. Facebook was also hugely important in sharing the disinformation that uh, pulled, pulled the Christian and Muslim community and uh, apart from the Buddhist ma majority and um, fueled this horrendous violence that we've seen at times with, you know, burning tires being put over Rohingya Muslim women as they tried to flee and so on. Um, and so I think it's a cautionary tale. Um, uh, and it reminds me that, you know, no one is free until everyone is free. And as many decades as Aung San Suu Kyi spent away from her family in difficult conditions to bring her people to freedom, I hope um, that, that she will reconsider bringing some of them and not all of them to that place. Well, here's a follow-up. Jeannie writes, I've worked in Myanmar with Rohingya refugee, refugees and other ethnic youth. How can we shift the youth affected by systemic violence to understand the other whom they've been taught to hate? That's a really important question, and it's actually a, a lot of what I focus on at the moment. I haven't had the chance to do that in Burma. I would love to. I've been working with Sunni and Shia kids a little bit in, um, in the Middle East, uh, who are in somewhat the same situation yes. where, you know, they they have the the choice really to be another link in a, a long chain of generational violence that's handed from one generation to the next, um, or to choose to be the generation that rejects the wars of their parents. But that's not a choice that um, is immediately apparent sometimes. I, I was talking with um, a brilliant group of young people just before this conversation, and I was saying to them that really they are the generation, this, this group of teenagers and young adults now, um, that is the first that the internet has been so woven into their daily life from day one, that they're really the first that, unlike every previous human generation up until now, from time immemorial, that has by necessity been separated 
vertically by geography. This is the first ever generation that can be separated horizontally by age globally and say, we as young people worldwide reject this, that, or the other policy of our parents or inherited hatred of our parents. And I think what we've seen with Greta's climate movement is really mm -hmm. evidence of that and really extraordinary to watch. And I, I, I think and hope that we are going to see a lot more of that when, you know, as young people realize that the mistakes that are being made um, by their seniors now are, they're, they're going to be left um, to, to tackle. And uh, it, it's, important for them to to not blindly follow um, the 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 decisions hatreds wars of their parents uh, what we can do to help I think in Burma and in the Middle East and, and others is to to give whatever tools we can to young people to have those conversations because I think the desire and the spark is there the tools that we learned, in the intelligence community, the, the the tools that you know human collectors learn in training are in many ways applicable, right? This is the idea of how do we create dialogue with the people we fear? How do we build commonality <coughs> with someone that hates us and we were taught to hate? And if we can take those same tools that we use for geopolitical purposes and, and repurpose them in this way where we give young people and others the the empowerment to reach out across divisions and and create connections even if it's again a tiny sliver of common ground um, then I think we will have we will have armed the next generation to do the work that I, I can feel them trying already to do. Well, I think this audience member, Steve, would like you to get even more granular mm -hmm. about the tools that you learned as a CIA officer in the sense that he writes, to what extent might it be possible for people in this room and beyond to learn and use a CIA technique to connect with and shift the thinking of extreme groups here in the US. And actually, I love this too, because I think I'd love to hear a technique. It would probably make me a better interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, so one of the peculiar things about agency training, I remember thinking like you would, you would be taught a technique and it would have a name and everything. And then you'd be like, but that's just like a, a completely natural thing that you do. But that's, you know, in a way it, it, you, you kind of need to pull apart regular human interactions and understand them in order to understand their value. Um, I mean, I remember like being told tactical parking and it's just like backing into a parking space. Right? So, <laughs> so like things, some, some things do just have, have names for the sake of having them. But um, one that, you know, one that, that always sticks with me because it seems so obvious on the face of it is something called give to get, um, which is the notion that when you're, you're, trying to um, connect with somebody or even to um, to coax some information about a potential, you know, in this case, attack or whatever the case may be out of them, that often it's important to, to be vulnerable, to give of your own information first. And the reason that I mention that is that uh, I found it to be really valuable in as a technique to, to teach these young people where you mm. say, when you're in a place where you're both digging your heels in and disagreeing with one another, uh, sometimes we expect the other person to realize they're wrong first, <laughs> right? And if, if you can pause and explain an instance where your thinking has evolved and you realize that you made a mistake, you were unfair, you were unjust, um, that can can often soften the conversation enough for this other person to feel safe about getting to that same conclusion where they too, you know, maybe need to evolve their thinking on certain points. Um, sometimes, you know, sometimes we forget the power of vulnerability and of being a, a raw um, human being, right? Where we show our weakness, we show our softness. Um, and we show our mistakes, and that allows other people to to feel safe doing the same. I mean, one thing that um, my my mother taught me when I was really little and has really stuck with me is um, 
people rise or stoop according to our expectations of them. And I really do believe that that's true. I think that if you go into a conversation express, you know, expecting somebody to, to be hateful, um, you'll often find a greater likelihood that they are. If you expect to find some commonality with them, you often will find that you do. Um, you know, we hit what we look at, as, as they say in defensive driving courses. Um, and I think, you know, just like Chekhov's gun, right? Like, don't introduce a gun to a scene unless you, you plan to use it as like a rule of thumb for, for, for writers. And I think it's true of all of our interactions is that we, we end up um, being responsible for not only our own behavior, but more than we like to think the behavior of others. Um, I, I, I think there's that quote around our, our greatest fear is not that we're powerless, but that we're powerful beyond measure. And um, I think we, we all do bear some responsibility for one another's actions and responses. Um, and as much as we can expect even our adversaries domestically in political life and overseas to be the humans that they could be, um, I think the more that we find that they become that. Well, <clears throat> this person asks, what do you think background experience personality made you effective in your CIA job or career? I know that they were drawn to you and recruited you because you did this great paper while you were at Georgetown working on conflict and terrorism that helped use data to determine where the next terrorist attack or violence could mm -hmm. explode. But over the course of your time with the CIA, you learned different strategies. So I'm curious what you do think made you mm. effective at your work. You also suggested earlier that more women, almost as if there was something intrinsic to that. I don't know if that's the case, but I just... Well, I, I do I, think, I do think there is something, I mean, uh, separately, I think there are two separate questions, but I do think there's something intrinsic in feminine problem solving or the, the what we would traditionally associate with feminine problem solving, even though it's present in all humans. You mean based on the experience of being a woman in this country? Yeah. I mean, I think that the, the ability to solve problems through emotional intelligence, intuition, multitasking, some of the things that we traditionally associate with the feminine in, in all of us, um, it, those are really critical traits for the human intelligence officer. And I think they make women particularly well suited to the work. Um, and what and, made you particularly well I suited mean, to the work? I mean, just to finish that point, I, <laughs> no, but I do, I am so heartened to see women in all of the leadership roles of the agency right now, right? This is a really momentous moment in history where, where we have a, a female director, but also um, female directors beneath her of each of the directorates. And I think that's very exciting and very hopeful. For me personally, you know, I, I, one thing that you notice in training is that everyone has things that they just are naturally gifted at and they're all different, and then there are things that have to be learned, right? And for me, you know, I, I learned all of the, the things that you have to around surveillance detection and all of that stuff, but they weren't things that, that I grew up doing. I wasn't, you know, particularly, like, naturally predisposed to, to situational awareness or, or surveillance detection. Um, for me, I think it was much more seeing people, you know, really connecting with people, being curious about people. And a lot of that came from moving a lot as a child, um, especially overseas, where I found that I, I had to be able to, to connect with friends quickly and to see who they were beyond whatever window dressing of kind of accent or dress or cultural habits were in a particular country when I arrived. My birthday was in September. So if I was, you know, I would start a new school year, not know anyone. And it, it was about um, being able to strip all those mm -hmm. things away and really um, see people and connect with them. And I think that that's, that's what we need more of in our in our geopolitics is the the ability to um, create dialogue through through some common ground in that way. Well, I think that's a good place to end it. Uh, on behalf of World Affairs, I want to ask our audience to join me in thanking Amaryllis Fox for being here today. Thank you.